Okay, we're going to get started again. So, um, deep learning is a very interesting topic because it's something old that is rebranded as something new. And it's also something that has made a very strong and indelible impact on machine learning in the last decade. Okay. When different machine learning algorithms get researched, you know, usually typically they're good for a particular data set. And um, you know, people, pay, people who have data sets that are like that particular uh, data set will then say, oh, maybe I should use this algorithm. Okay, so for example, SVMs or decision trees or AdaBoost, all of these are different algorithms. Okay, when deep learning first came out, um, it did well on almost every data set that it encountered. Okay, so um, people didn't believe it at first. I think you've heard some of the, the breakthroughs in deep learning, okay? The first breakthrough came in around, uh, I guess, 1998 where uh, we were able to see very good digit recognition, handwriting digit recognition from a neural net, which th previously people didn't think possible. That was followed up by speech recognition results that did uh, you know, very much better, you know, uh, tens of percentage points better than what was previously possible with lots of hand-engineered features, okay? And then now you see deep learning all over the news, right? Deep learning is everywhere. Uh, basically, it takes advantage of neural nets. It takes advantage of hardware. And uh, in this part of the tutorial or this lecture, I want to give you some intuitions why, OK? So um, to start off, I think it's quite fun to look at some places uh, that have neural networks for you to play with. So uh, you can go to this uh, in your spare time. Go to playground at tensorflow.org. Okay, this allows you to train a neural network using JavaScript. Okay, you'd never think JavaScript is a good language, but it's nice because you can see it, right? Okay, so you can say, oh, you know, I have some inputs, I want, you know, different things, I want all these things. Okay, I want more neurons, I want more hidden layers, uh, and I want a different data set, and I'm going to try different activation functions like sigmoid, uh, change my learning rate, and then boom, just watch it go and then uh, you can see whether it does anything interesting or not. So probably I did something not so good, so we'll see whether we can uh, get a, a better one. See? Try 10H. Okay, so it's starting to do something. Okay, and you can see what it's trying to do. So the negative ones are negative ones, uh, the positive points are blue, and, and you can see how, how the neurons are changing. You can see the visualization of the neurons as it's going, right? So have fun, it's quite interesting, and you should get some intuition for what, what's going on there, right? So, yeah, so if you don't want to pay attention to lecture, just, you know, fiddle with this, that's fine, okay? <laughs> All right. Okay, so what is deep learning? Right, you hear so much about it. It's deep, and it's learning, duh. Okay, not very useful, all right. So what does deep mean? It means that we stack many of these levels on top of each other. We already know what artificial neural networks are. They have hidden layers, but because of the computational bottlenecks, we couldn't train large networks, right? Up until the 2000s, basically, neural networks were pretty good, but the most we could do with the hidden layers was one or two layers, okay? That was about the most complex that we've got. Nowadays, if you talk to researchers in vision, they'll tell you, you know, hundreds of layers is okay. Okay? So there's a, something different. And why, why is that important? Because as I said in the last part of the last section of the lecture, each layer is in fact trying to do something non-compositional -compos uh, and non-linear uh, from the previous level. Okay? So what does this mean? It means that it's trying to extract features from the previous level. Something that, you know, you and I, in, in most of our machine learning, we would have to do by hand. We would have to say, you know, what types of things would be correlated to the output, okay? Make them as features, x1 or x2 or x3, okay? What we're going to do with deep learning is like, say, forget about that. I'm going to get the features, the useful features, by learning them, okay? 
Right. And so the second part of the learning is, of course, the learning. In many cases, learning just means the use of neural networks. But you can find other forms, although it's much less talked about, uh, that you can use other networks in this stacked regime. Okay? So stack, if you think about it, is some similar to ensemble. Remember ensembles? Ensembling is when we had several hypotheses and we had them vote, or we weighted their voting, or we used conditional uh, tests like in the decision tree. In stacked ensembles, what are we doing? It's basically we take the output of all of the different hypotheses and we feed it into another machine learner. Okay, that's what we're doing, right? Because every layer is basically another neuron competing a function. Okay? So what we're going to do is just basically do it uh, a layer, another layer, another layer, another layer, and then finish off at some point by getting the output. Okay? So that doesn't look very fun. It looks like a lot of computation, right? Certainly you never want to do a deep learning question on your final exam because that will be it. You know, your whole life will be over. Okay? So how deep is deep? Okay? It's deep enough that you will never encounter it on a final exam. Yay! Yeah, it's only, you know, because I can't possibly ask you to take derivatives of five layers. That would just, you know, you, you'd probably kill me in feedback. Okay? So, what are the uh, reasons why deep learning seems to be a good idea? Actually, we had this idea very early on. Okay? From the, the 1960s, people were thinking about this. You know, our brain is organized like this. You know, there are neurons touching other neurons, touching other neurons, touching other neurons, and they fire and they activate. The activation trails go all over the place. Right? The idea behind that is that each successive layer is learning some type of nonlinear transform, right? It's basically extracting features from the previous layer and providing it as output to the next layer, okay? So there's a, a proof, uh, not that uh, old, pretty recent, Hastad's uh, proof that says that in certain senses, even though we have a very deep network, we're getting a lot of representation power for a very little cost, right? Because if we had only a depth L network, Okay, we might need exponentially number of nodes to represent something that would be very compact to fit. If I only had, you know, one or another, another two layers, okay, I maybe only need two or three extra neurons there, and then I would have gotten something that would have been really complex to express if I had lots and lots of uh, uh, nodes at one hidden layer, okay? So the consequences of this is that, as I said, it's useful from a computational standpoint because you know I don't need so many nodes. You know, I can just array them in a stacked order and I get a lot of expressiveness for the same amount of computation power. And it's statistical, right? Because if I have a, a shallow network, I might have too little bias, right? I might not have enough parameters to fit the model. And by stacking them, I get that type of uh, more expressive power. Okay, so as I told you, um, artificial networks, ha neural networks have been, a long, have been developed ever since the birth of machine learning. Okay, from Romo Hart's time in 1968, when he came up with the very first algorithm you learned, that's the perceptron learning algorithm, okay, all the way back uh, 50 years ago. Okay, so why weren't they popular recently? Can anyone tell me without looking at your notes? Vanishing gradients, yes, okay, so vanishing gradients was a big problem. We're going to cover why that's, what that means and why that's important. Anyone else have another reason? Okay, you can look at your notes too if you don't, if you want. Sorry? Hard? Hardware. Okay, that's a really good point. Hardware became much better, right? We have Moore's Law to say that the computation will get easier, but in fact it was the invention of the GPU uh, popularized by NVIDIA that made it very easy to uh, uh, train neural networks, okay? So we are taking a look at this, right? Computational complexity, we have all those W's to try to do. We have to do them all, uh, compute the gradient for all of them, for every example, for every iteration. It's a lot of computation, right? And we saw here, that we have the vanishing gradient problem, 
Okay, that happens, as I told you earlier, when the weights are too large, you know, basically we have uh, gradients that look like a flat line, right? When there's a flat line, basically the weights don't move anymore. Okay, so there's a problem, okay? And because for a while, other machine learning algorithms took the limelight. So when uh, Vladimir Vatnik in the 1960s created support vector machines, it wasn't popularized until the 80s when he came to the US and uh, word got out. And then everyone was paying attention to the support vector machines for a while. Okay? So we have the perfect storm of things in the last decade that have seen the renaissance of artificial neural networks. It goes by a new name called deep learning. That's all it is, right? So one is the importance of big data. Nowadays, we have so many sensors like uh, fitness trackers, I don't know, uh, home devices, etc., all generating raw sensor data. Okay, we are blogging, we're tweeting, we're generating lots of language data, but it's really hard for us to compute or come up with features by hand. And what the neural networks are doing is because of this layer by layer, it's creating features by itself. Right? Learning what representations are good for solving the problem at hand. Okay? Hardware support. Okay? So uh, when we have GPUs, these are multi-core, but not just multi-core in a small way, in a very massive way. Right? We can have thousands of units of computation power all on one chip, on one board. But more importantly is the fact that those chips can handle massive amounts of data flowing through them, okay? It's not that the computation speed is any faster. It's in fact a lot slower, but because it can slug through so much data all at the same time, computing gradients, computing tangents, etc., okay, that we can uh, get almost a magnitude faster in training time, okay? And these are actually not too important for our course. What we care about are the algorithms and concepts for deep learning, which make it useful, all right? So we have uh, developed in the last decade good training algorithms for this idea of having many layer networks, okay? And we'll see why that's important. I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn. But let's start by thinking about a simpler form of deep neural network the precursor, it's still very widely used and alive today, it's called convolutional neural networks, okay, or CNNs. So what is a convolution neural network? Well, if you know anything about convolutions, if you've taken image processing or vision, anyone here have taken those classes yet? No? Okay, when you get to uh, uh, Prof. Leo's class, then you just tell him, I know what convolution, uh, convolution is already. Okay, so what we're going to do is think about this image. Okay, this is an image of a six. It's from the same digit problem that we are familiar with. And what we're going to do is we're going to extract the rows out. Okay, so we have the first row, the second row, the third row. So we're just going to make this a very long array. Okay, let's say it's 16 by 16, so I have 256 inputs all in a single row. Okay. I'm going to turn them on their side so it looks more pretty, and I'm going to feed them into a neural network. Okay, so I have uh, the bias term, right, one, that's my x0, and then x1 through x256, all of those as inputs. Okay, and this is a fully connected uh, neural network, okay, here, uh, and I'm just going to try to connect all of the pieces together. All right, so let's take a look at one particular part okay, that I want you to think about. Okay, let us take a look at this particular neuron, okay, in the black. Oh, neuron or unit, up to you. Terminology is the same, all right? If I have arrows like this, the blue arrows on the top that indicate a strong positive weight and the gray arrows indicate a strong <coughs> negative weight, what do you think this neuron is doing? What is it trying to find that is going to cause it to activate and cause all of the outgoing blue edges to turn on? Well, let's see. Well, there are two black ones here. So if they're on, let's say they're ones, then this would output a two. But let's say maybe the signal would be strongest when all of these nodes are on, right? If all of these were black, 
you agree that the sum would be very big, right? And then I would probably get a, a strong activation here. So what's this uh, particular detector doing or this unit doing? It's finding lines, horizontal lines. Okay, I'm just going to write H line here. I can't write very well with the trackpad. I dare you to do better. Okay, on the top row. Okay, yeah, I can't write very fast. Sorry. Okay. Okay, that was easy. Let's try this one. What is this one doing? Well, let's see. It's got mm, the first free turned on from the first row, the second free turned on the second row, the third free turned on the third row. We don't know about, about the rest. Let's just assume all of the rest are off. Then what is it doing? When is that going to be activated? If those nine lines are the only blue lines that are active for this neuron. It's taking vertical lines of some sort, but it's limited to just the top patch here. Good try. Okay, so you can see these nine lines correspond to the top nine cells in this part, right? Can you see that? Because I have the first three inputs here, the first three inputs here, the first three inputs here. So it's this top corner patch. Okay? All right. So you can write this like top left hand corner or whatever you want, okay? So these are all strong activations for this particular uh, neuron, okay? So what we can think about is that in that case, the second case, it's like what we call a convolution, okay? A convolution is like this, all right? Basically, we have a patch, okay? Like this yellow patch. And we want to perform some type of operation on that patch and then output a number into a particular cell. Okay? If you notice, uh, when these things are scrolling around, that um, there are certain multipliers in here, right? So you can see that the multipliers of plus uh, uh, times one appear in a cross pattern, right? So what I'm doing for each cell in this convolved matrix is to take the sum of all of these things, right? I'm taking the input, which is the uh, underlying yellow cell, timesing it by its weight, that's the uh, red uh, coefficient, summing all of the nine cells together, and then outputting that here, okay? You can take a look at some of these other image kernels here. This is a very nice page to see what's going on for some of them. So you can choose different types of things. And basically, it ends up being something like what you would do in Photoshop, right? If you wanted to, let's say, uh, sharpen the image, you could choose uh, a different thing or outline the image. Okay, so this makes uh, only uh, very salient white pixels show up, okay? So these are uh, some of the other ones that are here, okay, sharpening basically says, uh, emphasizing the difference between, sorry, uh, the difference between adjacent pixel values, okay? This makes the image look a little bit more vivid, all right? So if you use any type of Photoshop editor, you know, on your phone or something like that, it's basically doing this type of problem called convoluting, right? Okay? Basically taking patches of the image, applying some transform to it to get the output. Okay, and the output is the same image, just with different values. Okay, so for example, when we pass uh, one layer of the neural net, okay, through the uh, features of a convolutional neural network, we might get things like vertical lines, we might get horizontal lines, and we might get small circles, okay? Sounds good. Those are features that sound may be relevant to computing which integer it is or which digit it is. But these are not in uh, position in variant fashion. You know, I only know lines at the top row, lines in the middle row, lines at the bottom row. They're different neurons. Okay? So 
How can we solve that? Oh, that's really easy, actually. I'm going to do it by stacking. Right? I'm going to put another layer, and then another layer is going to learn lines in general. Okay? Horizontal lines in general, because they're going to get the inputs from each of our horizontal line detectors, and it's going to just say, oh, you know, I'm going to fire if there's a horizontal line in the image. Okay? Or I'm going to fire when there's a vertical line. Or maybe I'll fire when there's a circle because it has all of these as its component inputs from the previous level that was position sensitive. But now because I've composed it at another level by stacking, I have position invariance, right? Okay. So eventually I can use that to, for example, decide that that number that you saw was the number six because it has a small circle, no lines, vertical lines, or et cetera. Okay. So when you look through um, uh, pictures of systems that are creating features through machine learning, just like the one that I showed you from TensorFlow, you'll find images that look like these. These are the features that the neural network is finding in the component images when trying to optimize for the output classifier. So it's basically saying that these set of features that you see on the screen are good components that help me figure out whether it's a six or it's a five or whether it's a cat or it's a car, okay, anything like that. All of the intermediate features that help to predict the output. Okay, so a convolution neural network, as I told you before, is something like a um, fully connected network, but it's not fully connected. Why? Because of two things, okay? It is because of what we talked about, the convolution patch, okay? That patch is specific to, let's say, a nine by nine grid. That means an uh, input, uh, sorry, a neuron is only connected to nine other neurons, not all of the neurons in each level. So that means that there are fewer parameters on a convolutional neural network than a general fully connected neural network, so it's easier to train. There are less parameters to figure out. Okay? So this was the first uh, deep neural net that had a lot of success. Okay? And uh, you can use convolutional neural nets for your images, uh, faces in the wild uh, data set, for example. And here are some of the types of features that it looks for. So you can see here, even at the top corner here, it looks like it's learning honeycomb patterns or textures that would fire for you know, certain types of images that have uh, you know, some synthetic textures. Okay? So this is in uh, layers three through five, so it's not the first hidden layer, but the second, uh, but the third, right? So you can see it's composing these basic features of lines and edges to get back something more sophisticated. Okay? So uh, this is what I just basically said. Uh, we have uh, an image network where uh, features are local. Okay. So um, we actually only have weights. Uh, instead of having so many different weights, all of the weights for each of these things at each level are the same weights. They're tied together. Okay. So we will learn one set of weights for the entire uh, uh, feature map, okay, and this is fed through several different feature maps here, and uh, we get the final output at the end to uh, uh, predict uh, a particular class, maybe a digit, maybe an animal, or something like that, okay? Okay, uh, another thing that you'll see in, in a lot of neural networks is the idea of pooling. Pooling means we downsample the data, so we general helping to generalize it. So for example, here in this particular red patch, it's a two by two patch. It has four integers. If we do max pooling, it just means I'm taking the max of each of those four, okay? And then using that as the output. So max pooling basically uh, diminishes the resolution of the convolutional neural network, okay? Making it helpful to generalize, right? Because maybe we find features that are in different parts or at different scales, then we can use pooling to help with that. Okay? And typically, when you look at illustrations of uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, you'll see that they're interleaved between convolution layers. So you can think of each of these green layers as the feature extraction. 
So I want to find edges, I want to find circles, I want to find diagonal lines, okay? Then I'm going to pass them through a pooling layer that says, I want to reduce the size of my resolution so I can find these features at a different scale. Maybe I want to find bigger circles or bigger lines, or longer lines, okay? Then I need to do it at, on a, uh, a data set with reduced resolution, okay? So that's why you can see the green and the blue and the green and the blue are always interleaved until we get to the final output. Okay, so I'll show you one other demo because demos are much more fun than me talking. Okay, so here is um, a neural network looking at the MNST data set. So you can see all of the examples that it's trying to learn. Okay, and how it's changing over time. And you can see all the weights that it's learning for each of the different parts. So it's being fed a particular uh, number like two, seven, five, et cetera. You can see how the gradients are changing, okay? And just like we saw in the previous slide, you can see there's a convolutional layer, okay? Followed by some type of activation, followed by max pooling, followed by convolution again, and then pooling, and then other things, okay? So this is a fully connected layer, and then a soft max, which is then trying to classify which digit is it. And you can see it's getting better. It doesn't know what this one is yet. You know, it doesn't know what that, I don't even know what that is, okay? But uh, hopefully it, you think it's getting it uh, somewhat correct, okay? I'm gonna pause this, otherwise, you know, my slides will die. Okay, so keep on going. So uh, the last part I wanna cover is about training deep neural networks and just at a fairly abstract level, okay? Now, the train a neural network is not any different than uh, a standard neural network. Deep neural networks are the same. We train them using stochastic gradient descent where we do feed forward to calculate, you know, how the, the values change over each right, in order to get the final output, and then we do a back prop the other direction, okay, and to finally get to the first layer, okay? Okay. So if you look at the network, okay, there's one part of the network that you might look at, which is uh, between two hidden layers. And what we want to notice here is that the hidden layer at the previous level, which is closer to the output, has larger activation. Okay, why is that? Because when we pass the, the uh, weights back to the previous layer, they get spread out more thinly. So you can see that the, the activations here are not very strong. Okay, that's a problem. Why is that? Because it means we're going to have less and less gradients to train on. Okay, so if you go back farther and farther in the network, so let's say, for example, here, at this layer of the network, which is pretty close to the, to the actual uh, value that we want to predict, okay, our speed of learning is pretty fast. So it says 10 to the 5 here, I think, okay, 10 to the 6, okay. So that's pretty good. We can train that very well. But let's take a look at this next layer, okay. That gets a bit slower, okay. The red one, even slower, and the green one, very, very slow. So it's maybe thousands to tens of thousands times slower to train layers closer to the front of the network due to the fact that the tang function has these very sharp edges at the end, right, that have almost zero gradient. Okay, so when you uh, back propagate, back propagate, back propagate, back propagate, you're getting farther away from this useful part in the middle where it has this sort of linear activation to this part here where it's pretty flat, okay? And because the gradient is non-zero but very flat, it takes many, many iterations to figure out what's going on, okay? So to solve this, people have been thinking of uh, changing the activation function, the non-linearity, okay? This doesn't look very non-linear. In fact, it's not, right? It's a very simple function, right? It's just the maximum of zero and x. How simple is that? That's really simple, okay? But you might be thinking, wait, why does that work? Because all this time we've been talking about sigmoids, twice differentiable, making sure they sum to unity. Isn't that a problem here? Well, it's a problem only in the final layer of the neural network where you want to calculate the probability of something. 
in the middle of the neural network, all we care about is whether we can learn well, okay? Meaning that we have a gradient that we can differentiate and set, okay? So the gradient of this is pretty simple, right? It's just one, right, the x. So that's very easy, we can sum that together, that's very simple. So we don't have any exponential operations, and we don't have this problem where the gradient is flat, okay? One con that it has is it's quite sensitive to setting the learning rate eta, but we uh, can solve that by being a little bit street smart about how we set our initialization. Okay, the last part I wanna cover is about uh, initialization, okay? As we saw in neural networks, we can initialize by setting the vectors all to zero. It was recommended that we set them randomly, okay? But we can do a little bit better than that. In fact, when you have deep neural networks, because there's so many parameters, it becomes very hard to set the parameters well using randomization. Because you'd just be you know, trying to find a needle in a haystack that's going to get you to the nice local minimum. So what we're going to do is we're going to pre-train the network using unsupervised learning, okay? And when we do that, we're gonna say the supervised segment later on is just gonna tweak the weights just a little bit here and there to get the final results, okay? How do we do that? We're gonna go through this very simple idea, it's very powerful, the idea of an autoencoder, okay? So an autoencoder is really funny, okay? Here are the inputs x1 through x6, okay? okay? What do we want to learn? x1 through x6, exactly. You give it a one, it should come out with a one. You give it a two, it comes out with a two. Well, that doesn't sound very hard, right? I learned the identity function. Not hard at all. It's only hard when you have this, okay? When you have smaller number of inputs then you have a smaller number of neurons than you have inputs, okay? So what's going on here is I have only three nodes to learn six inputs and be able to reproduce them, okay? So I don't have enough neural capacity to make it easy. I have to do some type of compression, but learn the compression in order to get a representation, okay? So I can do this. Uh, using the same type of uh, training, E in to minimize the training error so that I can correctly reproduce all of my inputs on my outputs by using a smaller representation. But additionally, I'm going to use regularization. We already talked about regularization earlier. So we're going to use sparse regularization, which is setting an L1 penalty, right? That says, I don't want all of these edges to be turned on. I want some of them to be turned off so I can generalize better, okay? That's where the word sparse comes from in sparse autoencoders, okay? So we have uh, uh, the normal penalty for fitting. You know, that means I want my output to look like my input. That's this part. And I want it to be sparse. I don't want all of these arrows to be used. Okay. So when we do that, we will train a hidden layer. Let's say I want to fix this layer first, right? So I'm gonna train that hidden layer using unsupervised learning. It's unsupervised because I just give the inputs as the correct outputs, okay? All right, then I get rid of the hidden layer. Uh, sorry, the, the output layer, okay? This is what I'm after. I just want these weights to be good, okay? And then I train the next layer, okay? by taking this as the input and then trying to train this layer now, uh, which is the second hidden layer, okay? And I'm gonna do that for every hidden layer until I get, get to the output layer, okay? And then I have the output. In this case, it's a soft max classifier, which basically is like the logistic regression, okay? But it's for multi-class output. So instead of saying one or zero, this gets to choose, let's say, digits one through nine, okay? All right, once we have the entire network pre-trained, we just use the standard method of doing back propagation, forward propagation with back propagation to fine tune the results. Okay, this is pretty much the last slide, okay? 
There's one other regularization technique that's uh, uh, mentioned for deep learning, and that's the idea of dropout. Okay? So dropout, I think you should know about because it's actually really interesting because it's very close to the idea of an ensemble. Okay? So what we do in a deep neural network is if we have fully connected layers like this, you already know there's a lot of parameters they can overfit. Okay? So what we're going to do is do something like what we have on the right, which basically says for each particular example that we're going to train our neural network on, we're going to randomly shoot, kill 50% of our neurons. Okay, this sounds like really stupid, right? You put your brain through an x-ray machine, you fry it halfway, and then you train your algorithm. That's exactly what we're doing. Okay, so for each training example, we're killing off half randomly of the neurons, and we're training the network. And what it's doing is it's going to be able to generalize better because there are fewer uh, nodes that are active, okay? You can think about, you know, all of these random uh, dropouts as different types of G of T from our ensemble lecture. Remember ensembles, right? We said we have different data sets, okay? Now we have different classifiers, but drawn from the same parent classifier, which is our fully connected network on the left, okay? You compose all of them together, and then we get uh, uh, a trained network which is much more robust. It generalizes better. Okay, so this is really my last slide, and sorry it's uh, gone quite long. Okay, so today we looked at deep neural networks. There is a lot more in store if you're interested in this topic. There's a lot of different neural networks that are out there. So ones that we covered today, for example, are the convolutional neural networks. We said they are uh, a simplified form of this multi-layered perceptron that is fully connected because we have feature tying and we only connect certain neurons to others. Okay? They're really good for certain things that have local features like audio or images. You can think there's a patch of the image that can be classified separately from the rest. Okay? Recurrent neural networks have been around since the very beginning of neural networks. They are for time series prediction. So for example, if you wanted to make yourself rich by predicting the stock market, you would go with something like this, all right? Recursive neural networks are also confusingly called RNNs, okay? They're slightly different. They have some type of structure, hierarchical structure in the hidden layers, and they're good for some type of structured input like language input that might have subjects and objects, things like that. Okay, and long-term, long short-term memory networks are LSTM networks. They're also a type of recurrent neural network, so it's a subclass of this. They're used to describe long-distance dependencies when there's things from previous uh, uh, instances many times back that might affect the current inf information. Okay, with that we finished our neural network layer uh, uh, lecture. Basically, we looked at neural networks and backpropagation, and we took a quick look at deep learning, where we just saw it was a, a matter of stacking neural networks together. We saw that were three important innovations that made deep learning currently possible. So uh, next week will be our last lecture, where we're going to cover revision and the topics for the final exam. Again, your homework is due tonight. We will have your uh, homework twos, hopefully back to you uh, next week. Okay, that's all.